I am really psyched to be here. <laughs> uh, it's my, my first time here. I've been in Vancouver a number of times. I, actually, there's a big psych convention going on right now, the, the Western Psychological Association. We meet here probably every five years. And I've been here a number of times, way back when they had Expo here. And I was here once to take a train to go to uh, Banff and a boat to go to Alaska. So I, if I didn't live in San Francisco, I would live in Vancouver, for sure. Um, so I, instead of giving a talk, uh, if people ask general questions, then I can answer the questions. They can be about anything, about research I'm doing, the book, research I'm going to do, my childhood. Um, <laughs> literally anything, anything that you want. What? They would call blue, of course. <laughs> So, so either you can call out a question, or if you have a serious question, you have to go to the microphone someplace there. Uh, uh, Freud, um, uh, good old guy. Uh, not a lot of laughs. Um, uh, what's interesting about Freud is that um, he was one of the first people to really try to understand human nature across the board, not only why some people go crazy, but really about how personality develops. A lot of his stuff is not only about individuals, uh, but also he has lots of work on religion, on, uh, you know, on uh, group dynamics. The problem is some of his theories have not proven true when research was done. In his era, essentially, what he did was he was a therapist. He had patients. And his, his brilliance was to be creative. He had a bunch of patients, and he looked for what are the patterns, rather than I fix this broken mind, I fix this broken mind, I fix this broken mind, you know, as most therapists do. He would see what's similar about this woman's problems, this guy's problem, and then comes up with these theories. So, so for me, the, the, the brilliance of Freud was to look at individual cases, individual instances, of people who came to him because they were suffering, and for him, not only to try to treat them, but to go to the next level and say, how can I understand what is common across all of these patients, which may be common among other people? So, but a lot of the problems he was dealing with was of another era. So lots of problems we have, lots of problems you may have. Uh, Freud's theories are not as relevant because it was embedded in, you know, 1800s, early 1900s, in, in, a, in a totally different culture but nevertheless uh, brilliant. In most cases, Freud is really more honored in drama schools and English departments than in psychology departments, because psychology departments are focused much more on experimental research, and his ideas are stimulating to playwrights and dramatists and, and, and uh, uh, English, English majors more than psychologists. Need a little of each. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's obviously the age-old controversy, and the answer is, in fact, it's always an interaction. So it was um, that what child psychologists, people in developmental, are, are now proving is that babies come into the world with an enormous amount of talent. That is, uh, they come into the world uh, with, a, with an evolutionary legacy, much more than just genes. That, that newborn babies, or certainly within the first three months, can do things that they were never taught. Just, just the fact that young children, 18 months old, can in a short time master every language known throughout the world. And it takes any of us, once we get past that, that era, that age when we are receptive to words, receptive to concepts, it takes us years to learn what a baby can learn in, in, in a few months. So that says their brain is wired in a special way to pick up sounds, to decode sounds, to separate out a flow of sounds into phonemes, into words, and then to give it meaning. So, so clearly we get a lot. The problem, however, is um, uh, with, the, with the year of the genome, where, where biologists, chemists are, are sequencing the human genome, the, the pressure was on to say, we can explain everything genetically. 
And that is not true. You can explain physical things about us, you can explain some things about disease, but when you come to any kind of human behavior, it's, we are so complex that it's not in a gene. There's not a selfish gene, an altruism gene. So for example, if your mother was schizophrenic and your father was schizophrenic, you know, you are heavily genetically loaded to be schizophrenic. But in fact, the probability or the risk is only 50%. If your parents are both schizophrenic and they have two kids, one of you could be schizophrenic and the other totally normal. So, so, so the genes don't determine behavior. It's always the genes and that's where the environment comes in. In the work I've been doing, uh, summarizing the Lucifer Effect, and we have a wonderful website, you're going to love when you, it's just www.lucifereffect.com, one word, uh, and it has not only everything about the book, everything about the Stanford Prison Experiment, everything about me, I have a funny picture, I have a whole photo gallery uh, with, with interesting and funny pictures, and lots of stuff to download for term papers. Is a reference list on evil, 200 items. Uh, and then at the end, I want to talk about my new direction is on heroes. It has essays about everyday heroes. And, uh, and actually, all of the media stuff I've been doing, I've been going around the world talking about this. And so, some of you saw the John Stewart show, it's there. You click on it, and you see that little piece. Um, so, so, the point I've been making is that evil and goodness are not in people. You're not born evil or good. Essentially, my, my work is really a celebration of the human mind. The human mind has the infinite capacity to make us be anything, to be kind or cruel, caring or selfish, creative or destructive, and it pushes some of us to be bad guys or villains, and other people to become heroes. And the argument I'm making is the same exact situation that makes some people take the path uh, to become perpetrators of evil, to do really bad stuff, the middle path is most of us don't do anything. We look the other way, we smile. I call that the evil of inaction. But in that same situation, there are some people, usually a small number, who take the heroic action. And the heroic action, to be a hero involves two things. You don't have to have a Spider-Man outfit. You don't have to be Captain Marvel. You don't have to take off your glasses and Clark Kent become Superman. All you have to do is to be a hero is to do two things. You have to take action. You can't be a hero without doing something. And that seems obvious, but in fact, most people do nothing. Most people do nothing because your mother says, don't get in trouble, don't get involved, mind your own business. You say, Mama, I, I love you, but you're wrong, because my job is to be a hero, and I can't be a hero sitting on my butt. Okay. And the second thing is, again, you survive by not putting yourself out there, by not taking risks. And the hero takes a risk. The hero says, Although I want to live, although I want a career, although I want good things to happen to me, at some point at this moment, I'm going to do something where I'm not egocentric, but I'm going to be sociocentric. I'm going to be concerned about helping this person or this group or this concept, this ideal. Um, and of course, so, so the argument I'm making, this is supposed to be the end of the thing, but I'm working on that. Uh, so the argument I made in the book is in the last chapter, I have a whole thing on the psychology of heroism. I begin by saying, you know what? We don't know anything about heroes. Psychologists have not studied heroism. And it's funny, we, we study violence, we study aggression, we study prejudice, we study all that bad stuff. And we, don't, we never ask, well, who are the heroes? In fact, after the Holocaust, where millions of people were killed by this efficient killing machine called Nazi, Nazi Germany, it took 20 years before anybody asked the question, did anybody help? We were obsessed with these horrible pictures of concentration camps. You know, here, here are the, we, we, we found the Nazis who did these terrible things, put them on trial, executed some. And it took 20 years after that before somebody said, did anybody ever help the Jews? And it turns out in every country of the world, uh, people helped the Jews. Christians helped, Christians, not Aryans, in some way helped Jews. They, they hit kids, they hit families. And this was at the potential cost of their life. Nazi said, anybody caught harboring a Jew will be killed. So you harbor a strange Jewish kid and we're going to kill your children. So that's a huge decision. But 20 years later, when you say, tell us why you did that, so heroic, every single person. I think they've identified like 2,600. There's a museum in, in Jerusalem where they have, um, what do they call it? Um, you know, the, 
the, they don't call it heroes, but it's, it's, it's uh, you know, pe people, people who helped, uh, help us, help us. Of, that is, and so every country throughout the world, people, people did that, and they have the names of all these people. In every case, they said, nothing special, no big deal. I did what I had to do. Well, 20 years afterwards, where you have survived, that's not the same as the day after the Nazi guy comes in and says, if you harbor a Jew, your family's going to be wiped out, and the next day, here's a Jewish family. So we don't, we don't know what is that decision matrix at the time when you're away, taking this heroic action and dying, or taking this heroic action to help a kid, and your kids might die. So what I'm saying, everything we know about heroes comes from retrospective diaries, retrospective interviews that are weeks, months, or years later. So we have to think of new ways of studying heroes. But the other thing is, we really want to believe heroes are extraordinary people. They are. The, the Superman, they are Spider-Man, they are the guy on the horse in, in, in the park, you know, with a with gun or something, you know, this thing. We, we, we want to think that they are these special people. And, and thinking that means what? It means we can't imagine being that. Well, you're never going to be Spider-Man, you're never going to be Captain Midnight, and you're never going to be any of the, these superheroes. Uh, but I'm arguing, you know what, most of the important heroes in the world are ordinary people. Most important people, most of the people in the world who become heroes are you. And by that I mean the act of being a hero is extraordinary because it's rare. And it doesn't involve some special ability, some special talent. It doesn't involve some super strength or to be really compassionate or really altruistic. It just means in some situation everybody's looking around and you say, somebody's got to do something, and everybody says, not me. You know, say, okay, I will, I will do something. Sometimes it's blowing the whistle to say, hey, you know, there's abuse going on here. Teachers abusing students, parents abusing somebody, uh, uh, the, the accountant is cheating, at whatever level the abuse is, or somebody needs my help. Okay. Somebody's life is being threatened. And you take action. There was a wonderful case, some of you may know about it, and then I'll get you a question. In New York, about a short while ago, on a subway train, on a subway station, there were 70, 70, 70, 78 people on standing on the train. And a guy, a white guy, um, gets a seizure. And he goes like, and he falls across the tracks. And the train, the subway train is coming, going to cut him in half. And everybody looks and does nothing, except one guy looks down, and he has the excuse not to do anything. He has two of those daughters with him. And he turns to a stranger, he says, take care of my kids, and he jumps down on the tracks, takes this guy from across the tracks and puts him between the tracks, and, and lays himself on top, and the train is coming, and this, the guy who's had a seizure is now starting to wake up, and, and he's putting him down and says, look, you don't know me, guy, I don't know you, uh, the train is coming, my kids want me to get back, please don't move, because the guy below him is moving up. And the train, so he's pressing this guy down, the train comes, it, it's 21 inches from the floor to the, the bottom of, of the train. This guy, the hero, and the guy on the, are 20 inches and a half. Another half inch would have taken his sprain right off. And he comes up, he survived, he comes up, and his daughter said, I thought my father was killed. He jumps down, the train goes over them. And he gets up and he says, and everybody's, oh, what a hero. And he said, I did, what, I did what anyone could do. It didn't take special ability to jump down on the track. And then he says the moral thing, I did what everyone ought to do. And this is a 50-year-old African-American construction worker who had never done a heroic thing in his life, will probably never do a heroic thing in his life. And so we don't, what was it at that moment that catalyzed action? Well, he looks around, nobody's doing anything. He's got the excuse. He said, I would if I didn't have my kids. He said, no, that's not enough. Somebody's life is at stake. And it's a white guy's life. I mean, it's not like a brother, not like somebody you identify with. But see, at that point, the heroic thing is it doesn't matter. So he's now saying it's a human being. And one of the reasons I think heroes do this is because you can imagine the reverse. Suppose that was you, and you're laying there, and everybody's standing around, and nobody comes to help you. Well, the idea is once we all think that way, that's the start of a social community. It's once people begin to think, I have to be concerned about other people to do whatever I can to help them with the hope, with a reciprocal assumption that if the tables were turned, they would help me.
And in fact, if we all thought that way, then that's the best safeguard against evil. And so my argument now, I've been beginning to push it, that's the new research I'm going to do is, how do we promote the heroic imagination in you, in young children, in young people, um, starting with the kindergarten? And I think, you know, what we know from psychology is that if you get people to think of themselves in a certain way, is if I get you to think that you're a generous person, I give you some tests, I say, you know, on the basis of the, these results, uh, you turn out to be more, a, a more generous person than most people. Even if we make that up, you're still lie. The next week we come around and there's a blood drive, you're more likely to give blood. Or the next week we come around uh, and there's a Red Cross drive, and you're likely to give extra money. Or you're more likely to, to volunteer uh, a day to work with some, uh, some kids from an inner city school. So just thinking about yourself in a certain way, or other research shows, if we say you're not the kind of person who lives, once you put that in your mind, you're walking down the street, you got some, some chewing gum wrapper, you're about to throw it down, you know what you do, you put it in your pocket. You don't even think that, oh gee, the reason I'm doing this is because they said that. And so I'm thinking that what, you, what we really want to do is begin to get young people to think, I'm a hero in waiting. That is, there will be a time in your life, in fact, not just kids, there will be a time in your life, maybe only once, when you're in a situation where something bad has happened, and some bad people are, do, some people are doing it, not bad people, some people are doing bad things because they make money off of it, they get some, some you know, personal pleasure, some arousal, uh, or they have been seduced into doing a bad thing, as in the Milgram study. Most people are doing nothing. And they're saying, mind your own business, it's okay, you know, why get in trouble? And in that situation, you're going to say, hey, wait a minute, here's my chance to be that hero in waiting. Here's a chance to take some action. Now, the action could be anonymous. The action could be, you send a note to the principal and say, this teacher has been abusing uh, this particular student. Uh, or you have a friend whose parents are abusing. Uh, and you go, you go to some, some authority. Or you do what this guy, his name was Wesley Autry, you actually are willing to risk your life to help somebody else. Because you know, when the tables are turned, you want somebody to be there for you. So it's not totally altruistic, I, I want to be a hero to help save the world. You want to be a hero because it might be the case that before you get your chance to be a hero, you are the victim and you want somebody to be there for you. So, so this, is what, this is the kind of thing I'm thinking, and how do you do it? Maybe we have to have different kinds of curriculum, maybe we have to have people, people begin to say, um, what are the heroic things you've done in the last year? Think about some thing that you may not think was no big deal. This guy Wesley Audrey said, no big deal. Or think about people in your life who've done something heroic. It seems to me, I grew up in the ghetto in the South Bronx uh, in New York. And there were, there were, in fact, I know, there were mothers, single mothers, families of four or five, who worked two jobs, horrible jobs, you know, as maids or, or even, more, even more demeaning job sacrificed every single day so the kids could have it better. That's heroic. It, fit, it's, it fits my definition. They're taking action on behalf of someone else without personal concern. And because there's no spotlight, because there's no, no media thing, it's not on Entertainment Tonight or Hero of the Week, they go unnoticed. But see, the hero doesn't want a reward. The hero doesn't say, hey, notice me. The hero always says, no big deal. But, but again, I think we need some way in our society to celebrate heroism. One of the reasons I came to this is, well, two reasons. Um, all of you saw the horrible abuses that American soldiers did in Abu Ghraib. British soldiers did the same thing in Basra, so it's not just America. It's really, it's really the evil that, that war brings out, the evil that prisons in war bring out. And when we saw those pictures, everybody was shocked, I was shocked. But I said, I've seen it all before. Those pictures were identical, except for the naked pyramid, uh, of what my guards did in the Stanford prisons 30, 35 years ago. Stripping prisons naked, putting bags over their heads, um, cool. having them do sexually degrading activities. In five days, college students playing the role of guards in the basement at Stanford University. And these were kids from all over the country. In fact, there was one of, them, one of the kids who was from Canada or brutalizing other kids, knowing at some level this is an experiment. By a flip of the coin, I could not be in my military uniform, I could be in the prisoner's smock. So at some level they all knew this, but they got so embedded in the power of that situation, the 
that they forgot. The guard said, these are dangerous prisoners, and we have to dominate them, we have to control them, we have to teach them who's for us. And at that level, those guards are no different than the guards in any prison in the world, and no different, I discovered, than the guards in Abu Ghraib. And so, so I became an expert witness to defend one of these guards, because the military and the Bush administration said, they're all bad apples. What that means for psychology students is, they are making the dispositional attribution. Take the badness is in the person. It's not, not nature, it's in the person. Probably these are bad seeds, they're probably always that way. Well, social psychologists like me come along and say, it could be that the problem is in the person, but we know situations can make good people do bad things. That's the message of the Milgram study. That's the message of the Stanford Prison Study. That's the message of, of all the research on conformity. Ordinary people can do really <laughs> dumb things in, in, when they're in a group. And so, so in my defense, I was able to get all, all information on all the pictures, and there are thousands of these horrible pictures, and all the investigative reports, and I got to meet this, the man I defended, his Staff Sergeant Chip Frederick. He was, the, uh, he was supposed to be in charge of this unit. And I got to know everything about that horrible place. And so in my book, I have two whole chapters, one about what was Abu Ghraib like, what was the situation like, the behavioral context, that's what we know. And then what was this guy like, what was his family like? What did he do before he got there? What did he do afterwards? And then I have the next chapter where I make the big discovery of who created that situation. See, psychologists never analyze anything at what's known as the systems level. We stop at the situation. In fact, clinical psychologists, uh, psycho psych psychoanalysts, psychiatrists, cognitive psychologists, they stop at the person. It's only social psychologists come along and say, the person is always embedded in what? In a situation. But I never asked who created the situation because in the Stanford Prison Study, I was the system. I started it, I kept it going, and I ended it. But now I said, who created this horrible situation? I'm great. Here's this guy, he's working 12-hour shifts from 4 p.m. to 4 a.m. How many days a week? Seven. That's seven? Seven. <laughs> How many days without a day off? 40 days. He works 40 days or 40 nights, seven days a week, 24-7, without a day off. For, and then they give him one day off and he works another two weeks. So he's working more than 60 days in a place which is filthy, uh, they didn't have enough toilets, there's feces all over, there's rats running all over, there's electric, electric, electrical blackouts. There are a thousand prisoners who don't speak English. Uh, many of them are naked because they didn't have enough uniforms. Many are naked because that was a policy of, uh, from, came down from uh, Rumsfeld, who was Secretary of Defense, as a tactic of dehumanization and humiliation. And in my book I have the specifics. What, it, what, it, what was Rumsfeld memo, memo said? Here's what we're going to do to, to break these prisoners. And to make it worse, the prison is under bombardment all the time. Because right across the street is a housing complex and they're shooting mortars and grenades. The British told the Americans, don't use that prison. It's too vulnerable. Also, that was Saddam Hussein's torture center. That's where Saddam, they would every week, they would put people on trial. And then some of them, they would put put them onto the neck and they'd have dogs come and eat their head. Or they'd hang them upside down and, and, and cut their heads up. I mean, so why would you want to use that setting? It was dangerous and it had, had this history of violence. The Americans, right, because we entered the war in a rush uh, and we didn't plan anything, we said we're stuck, we gotta use this. So they're using this wrong place. There's not enough electricity, there's not enough water. So nobody's taking showers, everybody stinks. It's the, and, and the prisoners are escaping because they're, uh, the guy I defended was in charge of 60 Iraqi policemen who were smuggling weapons in. Their families are give, paying their money to smuggle weapons in so that they can escape. So, so imagine, you were this guy, Chip Frederick, who was in his early 30s. He was a guard in Pennsylvania, in a prison for 200 people. He wasn't in charge of anything, he was just a guard. Now he's in charge of 1,000 prisoners, nine, nine uh, other military policemen, uh, uh, 60 Iraqi police, the places in the bombardment, it's, you know, they don't even have toilets, porta potties are flowing out, and people are being killed. Five guards and 20 prisoners were killed. And so it's, it's a nightmare, it's chaos. And what does he do when he finishes at 4 a.m.? He sleeps in a prison cell in a different part of the prison. He never leaves the prison. 
So we know, we call it the, a total situation. It's like being uh, embedded in some, some weird cult someplace. So he never leaves. So, he, so it's total job burnout. It's, you know what's, what extreme stress does on cognitive functioning. So his, his, his decision making is now totally impaired. And he's doing this every day, day in, day out. That's not the full story. The full story is he and the others in that basement are not real soldiers. He didn't tell you. These are army reservists. These are weekend soldiers. They have no training to be in a combat zone. Zero. You become an army reservist to make a little extra money. You, you get a few weeks training. You go in the summer. You they probably have a similar thing here. You, you want to use them mostly for, you know, if there's uh, some emergency in, in a town. So. so they have no training. They're sent there, and they are totally in charge of this whole prison. But it's worse. Why did the abuses happen in this place, in Tier 1A? This was the place where the military intelligence and the CIA, this was the place where they interrogated prisoners they thought had information about Al-Qaeda and then about the insurgency. The reason there were a thousand people there is this was, this was 2003. It was the start of the insurgency against the Americans. Just when Bush said, mission accomplished, we won the war. Uh, we well, should have said we won the battle, we're about to lose the war. Um, <laughs> but, and, and, and so, but now here's what's happening. The, the Navy SEALs, the armies go in, and they get all the, all the Arab men in the family, and kids too. And they bring them down here. And now they have these interrogators, we're going to interrogate them because we want to know, you know, you know who's, where's the... Where's the, where's the uh, uh, weapons, where's the ammunition, who's in charge? First of all, a lot of these people don't have any information. They're not part of Al-Qaeda. They just happen to be nearby some explosive thing. Secondly, there's not enough interrogators. There's not enough people who know Arabic language. There's not enough translators. Um, and so they start interrogating and they're getting nothing. And the pressure's coming down from the generals. The pressure's coming down from the Bush administration. We need to know, we need to get the information to stop or counter the insurgency. So what the military intelligence and the CIA do is they go to these seven military policemen whose job it is what? Military police maintain the security of the prison and they protect the prisoners. They say, no, no, you have another job. Your job is to break down the prisoners, break down the resistance, prepare them for interrogation. Take, and I have, take the gloves off. Take the gloves off when you fight bare fists so you don't use the regular rules. So they are now encouraged to break the law. Encouraged because they're not getting any information. And they start doing the things you saw in those pictures. At first, the pictures are posed. So the picture of this, this young woman, Lindy Eglin, where she has a dog's leash on a person's head, around a person's neck, and she's dragging him on the ground. That is the ultimate dehumanization, treating another person as an animal. Well, that picture was posed. The, civil, the military intelligence gave her a leash. She didn't go to Iraq with a dog leash. They posed it because then they would show that picture to guys they were going to interrogate. They say, if you don't give us the information, you're going, to be on, you're going to be on that beach next time. But once you gave permission to these soldiers to do this, they all had, they all had cell phones. They all had digital cameras. And they start saying, that's boring. We got a 12-hour shift. We're bored out of our mind. Why don't we think of something new? Say, well, why don't we pile them in the pyramid? Why don't we do this? And that's boring. Why don't we do this? Why don't we get him to masturbate? Why don't we get him to do leapfrog? Why don't... And so once you start on that slippery slope, it's exactly like the Milgram experiment. Once you press that 15 volt button, even though it's no big deal, then you know you're gonna to go to the 30 volt more. It's still no big deal. And you can't imagine when you begin that you're ever gonna to get to that last 450 volt, the volt thing. And the same thing there. These abuses occurred not one night, over three months. So you do something, and it seems funny. And then you get bored. You think of something more interesting. You do something that. Meanwhile, they were taking these pictures. They put them on a CD, and they're sending them around. Soldiers had those pictures on their screensaver, as horrible as it seems now. Why did they do that? Because the military police, the Army reservists, Military police in that dungeon are the lowest form of animal life, with one exception, the prisons. Those pictures are about bragging rights. The pictures are about, look what we could do. Look what we did do. And so they wanted the other soldiers to be proud, to say, wow, you guys could get away with 
real shit. I mean, whoever thought of putting people in a pyramid naked and so forth, and then taking a picture, taking a picture along, along the thing. Nobody ever even thought about that. And so it wasn't, it wasn't a secret until one of these army reservists gave the CD to his buddy who had been around. He said, hey, look what we can do, guy. And his buddy is a guy named Joe Darby, a private, private army reservist, the lowest of the low, not even, not even a corporal. He looks at these, and at first he says, it was funny, yeah, naked guys in a pyramid, I never saw that. And then he looks at the other pictures, one after another, forcing him to masturbate, forcing him to simulate fellatio, and they get worse and worse. And he says, wait a minute, we're supposed to bring freedom and democracy to these people, we're bringing humiliation and degradation. And he takes the CD and he gives it to a senior investigating officer. That motion, when he hand that disc over, that's an incredibly heroic action because he is the lowest level of a military person. He's giving it to a senior officer knowing that his buddies are going to get in trouble. And these are his friends. He's, he's in that unit. And he knows if they get in trouble, they're going to retaliate. But he did it. And he said it was wrong and I had, somebody had to do the right thing. Now again, this is going on for three months. And so lots of people knew it and looked the other way. There were nurses and medics who came down and filled out false reports that somebody who had beaten up, had been beaten up badly by Navy SEALs had fallen down, or somebody who had literally been murdered uh, had died of pneumonia. And so they are complete. They didn't do it, but they, that's, the, that's the, what I call the evil of inaction. So this guy, Joe Darby, said, you know, this is wrong. And then they started the investigation, and that's, that stopped the abuses, in, at least in that place. But... What happened to Joe Darby? They had to put him in hiding. He was a hero in hiding for three years. Not only did the other soldiers want to kill him, because all, all the people he, he, he didn't finger them, he gave the pictures, and they put themselves in the pictures. They are condemned. And so they got, the guy I defended got eight years in prison, another soldier got 10 years, Lindy Eglin got three years. So all the soldiers either got, got some prison sentence uh, or were discharged, various things. They wanted to kill him. Not only that, people in his little hometown in Pennsylvania, in Appalachia, they wanted to kill him. The newspaper said, Joe Darby is a snitch. Darby, the hero, is a snitch because what he did humiliated the American military. What he did humiliate the Bush administration. Not only that, they had to put his wife in protective custody, and then they had to put his mother, because people wanted to kill them too. And so they were all in protective custody for three years. They just got out. Uh, they, they kept him until all the trials are over. And they might still get killed, who knows. But So he is a hero who did this action knowing, he didn't expect it, this, knowing that there would be some retaliation. The good thing, he was just given uh, an award, a hero award at the, at the Kennedy Center by uh, 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 John F. Kennedy's daughter, Carolyn Kennedy. So finally he got, got some... Uh, uh, some accounting, and I have a whole section in my, my book about him. What kind of hero he is? He is the most ordinary people. Now the people in his hometown are pissed. They say, he's a hero, he's nothing. He's like the most ordinary person in town. He's somebody that can pass by, nobody even know he existed, even though it's a small town. And so they're angry because they have this conception, heroes should be special people. I'm saying, you know what? Heroes are ordinary people. Nelson Mandela, Mother Teresa, Gandhi, those people are extraordinary heroes because their whole life is about sacrifice. But you know what? They are the exception. Most heroes are like Joe Darby. Most heroes are like this guy Wesley Autry on the train. Most heroes are like my wife. I dedicate my book to her wife. She was the one who got me to stop the Stanford Prison Study. Exactly like Joe Darby stopped that. And so I'll, I'll tell you that, that story. So this is a special story for women. So uh, she was a psychologist at Stanford. She was my graduate student, very, very smart, and had just graduated in June. I was a thesis advisor, and she got a job at Berkeley. Stanford Prison Study now is in August, so she had just graduated. She's going to start teaching in September. I'm a thesis ed was a thesis advisor. We had just started dating. We waited until after she graduated, so my letters of recommendation wouldn't seem biased. Um, <laughs> and so Stanford Prison Study starts on a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and on Friday, I was going to bring a lot of, a lot of young psychologists down 
to interview everybody, all the guards, all the presidents, all the staff. The staff was just me, two graduate students, and undergraduate. We were, we were the, the staff. Because I wanted people to, who had no connection with the study to give us a fresh appraisal. So she comes down on Thursday night uh, because she's working in a library. And I said, you know, we'll go out to dinner. We'll go out to dinner. I, I was living in my office in the psychology department during that week. So I would be there. And what happens is at 10 o'clock, the guards line, line, take the prison cell, line them all up, put bags over their head, chain their ankles, have them put their hand on each other's shoulder, yelling at them. And this is just to take them to the toilet. It's the last time the prisoners could go to the toilet uh, until the next morning. If they had to go during the night, they had to urinate, defecate in the bucket. So this is the toilet run. And it's going on every night. And so I'm used to it. Our staff is used to it. We look out, no big deal. But she, you know, she's not used to it. So I say, hey, Chris, look at that. Meaning, look at this interesting kind of thing. And she begins to tear up. What's the matter? She, I, I don't want to look. I say, what do you mean? This is human behavior. This is you know, social psychology and you know, in the behavioral context, the crucible of human nature, you know, all that kind of shit. And, she's, <laughs> and she runs out. She runs out of the building. I'm not understanding. I'm saying, no, well, why isn't she interested in this the way we are? And actually, my graduate student uh, with me said, saying, what's wrong with you? And we run out, and she is crying and furious. She said, it's terrible what you're doing to those boys. They're not prisoners. They're not research subjects. They're boys. You know, almost all of them are under 21, and 18 to 20. And it's your responsibility. And she said, I'm not sure I want to have a relationship with you if this is the real you. I thought you were caring and loving and, 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 and warm. Uh, that's what you seem to be. She says, I'm not sure what is the real you. Are you this prison superintendent? At that moment, I said, oh my God, I have changed. Not just the guards and the prisoners. You know, you know, these are kids. I'm a mature person. I don't know, I was 38 or something at that time. I've done lots of research. But I made the mistake of being the prison superintendent as well as the principal investigator. As a prison superintendent, you don't, you don't end the prison because kids are breaking down. That means they're wimps. You know, send the student health and so forth. A prison superintendent, your job is to maintain what? The security of your prison. And the other thing that happened is, you know, maybe when I saw this on Monday, maybe I had a little revulsion, but then I saw it on Tuesday. By Wednesday, it's commonplace. This is what the guards do. This is the procedure. This is the administration. And by coming in fresh and seeing this for the first time, she's saying, this is horrendous. Not only that, it's your fault. She could have said, you know, you're the system that started it. And, and she just said, she didn't say you have to st st stop the study. She just said, be aware of how you have been transformed. The reason that's heroic is that we had parents' nights. We had those boys who were prisoners. Their parents came, the boyfriends came, the girlfriends came, their friends came. We had a priest. We had a priest come, and while he's interviewing one of the prisoners, he breaks down and he's crying hysterically in front of the, the priest. And afterwards, you know, I figured the priest is going to blow the whistle, right? He's going to say, wait, this is going to be fun. We say it's very realistic. Your simulation is very realistic. This is what we call a first offender reaction in prison. And in real prisons, they have to stop being emotional, otherwise they're going to get sexually abused as sissies. And he walks away. You know, and we had a public defender come down. We had a parole board headed by an ex-convict, a friend of mine, Carl Prescott. But in that parole board were secretaries, other graduates, so people had no connection with the study. And they could see these kids come in and say how terrible, you know a terrible experiencing the terrible things that are happening. And they say, interesting experiment. There were 30 or 40 psychologists who looked in on one way screen, and no one except that woman at that time said, what's happening here is bad. You know, forget an experiment, forget research subject, forget random assignment. Absolutely, this is bad, and you are the cause of it. And so since I was a system, I said, you're right. And so we ended the study the next day. We were supposed to go for two weeks. I don't even know what would have happened if we actually went and the two food. So, 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 those are, so this is a wonderful woman, a wonderful person, a smart person. I obviously ended up marrying her the next year, and we've been married for 35 years. We had a couple of great years. So. Why would you want to have a hero in bed as well as, as, well as telling you? <laughs> Really, that lovable guy, come and see. <laughs> but in fact, 
She's similar to Joe Darby. She's similar to Wesley Blaise Autry. She never before did a heroic thing. Never in her life did she do anything which resembles uh, being a hero. And the best prediction is she probably will never do another heroic thing. Only because she's never going to be in a situation which calls forth that, that set of, of, that matrix of being energized, looking around, nobody's doing anything, terrible things are happening. So most heroes are heroes of the moment, heroes of the situation, are one-time heroes. And, and so again, so the big message is, when that time comes, are you going to be, you're going to join the group? Because they say, hey, be a team player, get with the program, and end up doing bad stuff like an Enron or WorldCom or all these companies where you have administrative evil. Uh, or, or political evil, or you're just going to look the other way, which is the easy thing, and nobody notices. You know, you're never going to, you're never going to get singled out for doing nothing. What to do the heroic thing? You've been waiting patiently. Oh, oh, good. Well, um, okay. Uh, but, okay, I'm going to answer that very briefly because if you go to that Lucifer Effect website, buried in that says the Stanford Prison Experiment, there's everything about the prison, I mean like I've written five or ten articles, uh, there's a whole slideshow, there's video clips, and all the information about why we did the study, what we expected to find. Sim the simplest thing is, it's really more like a Greek drama than an experiment. It says, what, what, do you, what happens when you put good people in an evil place? Does the goodness of people dominate the evil place, or does the evil place dominate the people? And obviously, we're all pushing for, you know, we, we want we, 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 people, yes, evil place, no. But it's the same message in Stanford as the Milgram study. The majority of people can be easily seduced. The majority of people comply, conform, yield, yield to the power of the group, power of the situation. So the Milgram study is really about the power of an individual authority to influence an individual person. But, it's, but my, my said, oh, you should know, Stanley Milgram and I were high school classmates. We sat side by side in the Bronx in James Monroe High School. And in my website, if you go to Underfields and Martyr Photo Gallery, I found the pictures of our class, of him and me and, and, and us all together. So, so, but, so the interesting thing, but the prison study is so I said to myself, how often does somebody tell you, do a bad thing? You know, maybe a cult leader, maybe a gang leader, but most of our life is spent in what? In school, in families, uh, in hospitals, some in prisons. We end up in an old age home if we're in a Western culture. And so what is the power of those institutional forces to shape us? Also, oh, you'll love this, in addition to being a psych major, I was a sociology, anthropology major at college, at Brooklyn College. So sociologists are interested in what? They're interested in institutions. We're interested in individuals. So my training is nobody looks at what, is, what, what is, happens when individuals are in institutions. Well, all institutions are what? Made up of individuals. So the prison study really is say, here's a compliment to Milgram. Milgram is one book and the standard prison study is what happens when individuals are put in an institutional setting where the institutional setting is corrupt to begin with like most prisons are, like most, you know, a lot of police departments, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so they are like the bookends of, of this. But, but all the research on conformity, on role playing, on compliance, uh, other kinds of things, are in between this. I have in the book two whole chapters on exploring social dynamics. So this is social psychology for the general public. Unfortunately, most people have viewed, haven't even mentioned that, but I think that's going to be the enduring thing. It's everything about dehumanization, deindividuation, the power of anonymity. Not only do I describe the Milgram study, but I, I, I present all the research done since then that, that is not even in your textbooks. So I think for me, as I say, Stanford Prison Study concludes, here's how powerful a situation can be that transforms good kids, and we knew they were good, good apples because we tested them before, we picked only the most normal and healthy. Could happen in less than a week, but it's only one study. And I say, but therefore, before I say, let's go to Abu Ghraib with this one study in mind, let's look at all the research by Bandura, by Milgram, uh, by Solomon Ash, by Sharif, all these people. And so I have it all there. And then I say, now, collectively, we can go down to that dungeon 
because we know we have to have analytical tools. We have to understand how individuals operate. We have to understand how systems operate, situations, and then we have a new appreciation of how systems operate. Uh, and so that's, that's the lead in the chat as well. Great. Why, why do I become a sociology major? Even as a little kid, I knew I wanted to be, be a psychologist. I didn't even know what that meant, but I knew my occupation was to, to be interested in people. I thought maybe I would be a journalist, because journalists look like they interview people and write about people. Uh, because if you're poor, all you have is people. You don't have things. You don't have, people are your resource. Uh, uh, if you have street smarts, is what? Street smarts is all about how you survive on the street, people to people. So every, any kid who grows up in one of these intense inner cities is kind of an intuitive psychologist. Uh, and if you, if, you, if, you get, if you have the right smarts, you survive. If you don't have the right smarts, you end up beaten up or, or who knows what. Uh, so I get into Brooklyn College and say, yay, there's something called psychology. I want to do that. And I'm a really smart kid. I really work hard because my teachers told me the only way I'm going to get out is through education. You know, unless you're going to be an NBA star, unless you're going to be a, a super rock star, and there's one fraction, one, one half or one percent that do that, you get out of the ghetto, you survive out of poverty, only through the path of education. And I love being in school. School is clean, organized, orderly, predictable. You did this and this and this, you got a story. You did this and this and this, you got a teacher's pet. You did this and this and this, and good things happen. Where you came from, everything's chaotic. It's unpredictable. It's filthy. So school is a magical place. And they even gave you free books. And so I get to Brooklyn College, and I'm an A student. And I get one C in my life. In introductory psychology. My only C. It's like this big, big glowing thing, and it's still in the back of my brain. Um, and so, so, how do you explain that? So, either it's dispositional, either I wasn't as smart as I thought I was, or maybe I didn't work hard enough, maybe I was lazy, or it's situational. Maybe the lectures were boring, yes. Uh, uh, maybe the text was boring, yes, yes. And maybe in 1950, psychology was boring. And in fact, if you look back, it really was boring. You put that together, and I was bored. I was lucky I got a C. And also, it was the first time I was in a class of 300. They set you alphabetically, so Z was back up there. I couldn't even hear the teacher. Uh, they gave you multiple choice tests. You know, and I used to write. I said, it could be A, but B is right if you mean the textbooks. Uh, C is right if from your lecture. I had all the information. But, but, but D was the right answer, so you just put the D in. Didn't matter what you wrote in the margin. So, so I said to myself then, I said, you know, I didn't know what my, so I switched. I said, I switched into sociology because they're asking big, interesting questions. They were asking about, you know, ethics of the atomic bomb, this is 1950. And I took all sociology courses for the next three years. The problem is, there are no jobs for sociologists. And sociologists ask big questions, they never have an answer. <laughs> because they, they, don't, they don't have good methodology that we do. So at the end I said, you know what, maybe the issue is, maybe I ask the kind of questions sociologists would ask, like the nature of evil, but I use the techniques that psychologists have, namely experimental methods, psychological assessment, and so forth. So I switched into psychology in my senior year. I took, you know, one year I took all, all, this, all, the, all the psych I could, I could manage. Um, and so, so I, I vowed at that time, if I ever was a teacher, I would never give a boring lecture, no matter how many hours it took, no matter how much practice it took. If I ever wrote a book, it would never be a boring book, no matter how much I had to do. And if I was a researcher, I would never do boring research. And so my whole life has been based on that introductory psychology C. Uh, Freud would call it a reaction formation, right? <laughs> uh, for the Freudians and the uh, So, so this, this is the impact it had, had on my career wanting to be a psychologist, having this really bad experience, and then saying, it doesn't have to be that way. And again, so the message for you is, a lot of times in situations, you don't, you don't, you don't do what you expect, you fail. Um, and you don't succeed in some way you want. So the question always is, is it me, or is it the situation? And my argument now is, always begin exploring the situation, before, especially before you blame yourself. Just to say, now the first thing you say is, if other people are experiencing the same thing, it's less likely to be in you than in the situation it's affecting you. Just like you begin to get sick, 
if there's a flu epidemic going around, it's nothing about you, it's about the flu epidemic. Uh, on the other hand, there's a point at which you say, yeah, you didn't study enough. Other kids who studied did well. You only studied did poorly. Is there another question? Yes, sir. I mean, that kind of question is the, is the kiss of love for experimental psychologists. That when you simply say, I wonder what would happen if, and if the answer to the if is, if we vary one thing, all of research is just that. The last question you asked about the creative thing. It's, it's, what's fascinating about psychology is unlimited. If you simply are curious enough to say, I wonder what would happen if, in the Milgram study, it looks like he's used old men. I wonder what would happen if he had women. Well, it turns out Milgram did do one of the 16 studies with women, got the same effect. I wonder what would happen, you know, even let's say in the Milgram study, would it work for little kids? Would it work for older people? So when you ask, I wonder what would happen if, and then you, you bring to it the psychologist orientation of perspective, the answer to that question is we do an experiment where we vary one, uh, one variable. Um, so in role playing, so so two students of mine, uh, Judy Roden and Ellen Langer. Uh, uh, Ellen Langer was one of my first students uh, at NYU. Judy Roden was a graduate student when I taught at Columbia. Uh, when they were together at Yale, uh, they did a very simple thing, something like this: If you go to an old age home, in most cities, in most states, in most countries. You're likely to die within a year, no matter what your health is when you go in. It's a kiss of death going to, you're going to a traditional old, uh, old age home, except for the ones that are very, you know, for privileged people. Nobody understands why. Until you begin to look at how people are treated there, you're, they make you passive. You just lie there. Uh, because they're concerned about insurance, they would like you never to get out of your bed, in fact. You get out of bed, you're in a wheelchair. And you give up all of your sense of control. You know, the moment you walk in, you are a patient, you are a client, you are no longer a person. And so that's a role. Nobody says it. The role of person is a different role than patient. Patient means you are passive and you are turning over control to a nurse, to a doctor, to the authority. And they did a wonderfully simple study. This is a, 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 a Home for the Elderly in Connecticut, uh, this is near Yale. Uh, Yale is in New Haven, Connecticut, that state. And so they went in, and all of the people on one floor, they said, we're instituting some new procedures. Uh, we're going to have movies uh, every Tuesday at 7 o'clock. People said, oh, that's good. And also, uh, the nurse wants to give each of you a gift of a special plant. You give it also good, two good things. In another floor, they did something similar with a little change. They said, we're going to institute a program of movies. You have a choice whether you see the movie on Tuesday or Wednesday, whether you see it at 7 o'clock or 9 o'clock. You made a decision. Uh, we also want to give you a special plan, but you're going to have to take care of it and water it. That simple manipulation of giving choice and personal responsibility. When they came back several months later, the, the women, in that, these are mostly women and elderly guys that will die before they, they even get into the old age. <laughs> so so keep, guys, keep your health up. Um, so what happens is, in three months later, when they go back, the women who are given choice and responsibility are now physically healthier on all measures. On all, and then they go back a year later, and significantly more of those women are alive. And women in the other condition, where they gave them the movie, they gave them the plant, are dead. So here's a case, and it's, it's a startling study, and, and they did, it's, it's Roden and Langer, if you look it up, or Langer and Roden. That, that here's this thing where they simply, in a sense, gave you the role of being active about simple choices in your life. Being responsible for a plant. You can imagine if you had a puppy, would it be even more effective. But what it did, basically, and that's, that's the point you just raised, it made you less like a patient. It said, even though, you know, they have told your patient, you still have some control, some responsibility. And it changed, so here's a psychological manipulation 
that changed your physical health and made you live longer. So, so that's, I think that's a very, very powerful, powerful message. Um, and again, I think one of the worst things about being in any, one of the worst things about being in any institution is where the people in charge treat you passively. One of the worst things about being a student is when the administration and teachers treat you as a passive object that they are dumping information in and you dump it back on exams and they move you out and the next class comes in. Rather than say, you are a dynamo, you have this brain that somewhere out there is the next Einstein, somewhere out there is the next Freud, and their job is to find that rather than let me, t let me put in your brain all this old stuff uh, and, and you're going to regurgitate it on exams and term papers. Uh, so every, every institution is really set up for the people in charge to, to think about the people they're dealing with as passive objects. Students are more or less uh, smart, but I'm saying in hospitals, in old age homes, uh, in the military. And in many cases, your job is to say, I'm different. I don't want to be a patient. I don't want to be just a student. I don't want you to treat me like an object or a pupil. So my question is, is Oh, that's, that's not a one-minute answer. <laughs> no, no, just very quickly. I mean, psychology is not physics. I mean, psychology is about people, and people are subjective. And I think the best psychology is when you bring your subjectivity to it. Psychology used to be all about white men studying white students, white men, white men studying male students. What's wonderful about psychology is it's you. It's this sudden diversity of women going to psychology, Asian Americans, Asian student, Asian American, uh, Hispanics, black. And that the important thing is not to make it the melting pot. It's that each person brings in something unique. And the uniqueness is ideally you can ask questions that somebody from a different culture would never think of asking. And so that's what for me is exciting about your generation is that you're bringing into psychology ideas that I never had. And I'm waiting to hear what those ideas are. And it might even be a different way of, might even be a different kind of methodology for answering it. So, so I think subjectivity is good. Once you get to do the experiment, then you have to follow the canons of scientific method. Because if I want to replicate your experiment, you've got to be able to lay it out. Say, so I did A, B, and C. And if I do A, B, and C, I've got to get your same answer. So the objectivity is in the method. The ideas are in the subjectivity. And, and I'm saying the wonderful thing is that you guys and gals have a new way of thinking about the world that we never had. I mean, you come from a totally different technological era, different cultural era, and, and that's to be celebrated, not to be minimized. I think we have last question. Hi, so it's um, got to be really good. It is. Put a little pressure. <laughs> Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, okay. you're a different person if you grow up in this town than if you grow up in Baghdad right now. You're a different person if you grow up in the South Bronx than if you grow up in some privileged community in Beverly Hills. Uh, it depends on who your parents are. It depends if you're an only kid versus a big family. I mean, it depends if you, know, if you come from a, a Calvinist religion, a Muslim religion, a Buddhist religion, a Catholic. I mean, all of those things shape the way you think. And, and culture, see, psychologists have ignored culture until the last 10 years. One of, the, one of the best new Discovering Psychology videos I've just done is cultural psychology. It says we celebrate cultural differences. And cultural, culture says, here's a new way of thinking about basic things. About different cultures have different views of what makes somebody a good person, what makes somebody a, a whole issue of respect and pride and shame and guilt are culturally based, not just individually based. So again, what Freud didn't bring to the table is he brought Viennese culture from, from the turn of the century, and he would have not a clue about you know, how you deal with a patient from Vietnam or, or Korea or, or uh, Somalia or any other place, because his whole framework was limited by what he had available. Your framework is now unlimited. I think we have to end, sadly. It was wonderful. You're wonderful. And
morning, and I hope that um, the kids that, and staff and administrators that have been here this afternoon can take away with them the idea of being a hero and that the next time you have an opportunity to step outside the box, think outside the box, or act outside the box, that, that you do that and that you watch the other people who are asking the difficult questions and, and perhaps offering behavior that, that does not conform, that you see it in a way that perhaps they're a hero instead of something either evil or different. Thank you very much for your insight.